The last uh, long talk of today will be given by uh, Juan Garay. Juan is uh, currently a professor at uh, Texas A&M University. And before that, he held several positions in the university, uh, sorry, in the industry. For instance, he was in uh, IBM uh, TJ Watson Center. He was at Yahoo Research, Bell Labs, AT&T, and so on. Um, Microsoft. Who are, <laughs> yeah. Every, uh, yes, all over the research, okay. And uh, uh, Juan is uh, a prized possession of distributed computing community. Um, of course, his uh, works, his contribution go beyond uh, distributed computing. Com uh, computing. Uh, in fact, spreads across cryptography and uh, uh, information theory. I will share a uh, story, a funny story about him uh, of course it had some, there's about my slide that i saw no, no 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 it's not about your slide so a lot of my uh, phd uh, days were spent uh, reading his uh, uh, phenomenal work uh, on consensus so one uh, evening we all uh, post dinner we were uh, gathering at our lab research lab and uh, we had been discussing about one of his uh, papers and uh, uh, suddenly one of us uh, googled of his uh, picture okay then unanimously we have uh, awarded him the tag of the most stylish and uh, handsome cryptographer you still hold that <laughs> and uh, on the uh, uh, see on a serious note uh, of course i read many of his papers and uh, i really liked all of them um, and, but one of the works that I would really like to mention is uh, his work with uh, Warren Moses about uh, getting the first polynomial uh, Byzantine agreement protocol with uh, uh, t plus 1 rounds. In fact, so t plus 1 rounds is the optimal number of rounds that you need for uh, consensus protocol. The very first paper that introduced consensus, consensus back in 1980 um, that paper itself had given a protocol which took exponential communication and computation, but it had t plus one round complexity. And after that, the problem was open for quite a many years. And after I think 12 years or 13 years, they came up with the first solution, which was uh, fully polynomial. Uh, but in this uh, workshop, he is going to talk on something else, not consensus. So he is going to talk on probabilistic termination and composability of cryptographic protocols. And uh, thank you very much for agreeing to come and uh, give a talk here. Over to you. Thanks, Arpita. I'm working really hard on uh, you know this stylish uh, aspect. So, uh, <clears throat> can everybody hear me? Because my voice is. Um... So, in fact, this is also sort of related to consensus broadcast, and that's what the probabilistic aspect, um, probabilistic termination aspect. Um, that's how, uh, how we started thinking about this problem. And this is joint work with uh, Ram Cohen, Sandro Corretti from IOHK, Vasilis Zikas, and uh, Vasilis Zikas, which is at Edinburgh and IOHK. And the slides are by Ram, except that uh, there's a couple of talks, of, a couple of things I've been working on this. So the merging I did myself, all right? So any inconsistencies, uh, I take responsibility for. Okay, so probabilistic termination. So let's start with a motivating example. Coin flipping, like real coin flipping. All right. And so you're just flipping a coin with the probability of heads is a half. So question to the audience, what's the, how many coin flips do you need expected to get heads? 14. Right, should be two. Right, that's the expected number of times you get to try to to uh, flip to get that. And now assume that you have n parallel coins that you are flipping. All right. So same question. And now the question is, what the expected number of times that 
or flips that you have to take place so that all of them are heads. Nishan? <laughs> all right, it turns out that uh, it's a big O log N. And in fact, for some distributions such as this, the geometric distribution, it's exactly it's theta log n. Okay? So this is a motivating example. I will see why this is relevant. And in fact, there is an interesting fact that says that uh, the expectation of the maximum of m, uh, n random variables does not necessarily equal the maximum of their expectations. Because you have different expectations, you would say, well, it's the maximum is the one that is going to you know, be the bound for everything. It turns out that it's not. All right? So that's it. We, we'll come back to this example uh, later. Uh, we are looking here at this type of problem in the context of circular multiple computation that uh, I'll just go briefly on, and parties, computing a function, and so forth, and security formulation in the ideal world, right, where the trusted party is computing this thing that the parties want to perform. And then the security definition is called simulation by security, where these two executions should be indistinguishable in a context where some of the parties might be corrupted, corrupted by an adversary. Okay? And in this ideal world, also, we're going to have another adversary, green, you know, uh, more benign looking one that corrupt the same amount of parties. We will you know, do some things on this uh, execution. The adversary does what he does, right? And the distinguisher won't be able to figure out where the execution took place. And since you know, the execution here is ideal, you know, if this uh, protocol can emulate this, then the, the, the execution should be secure. OK, that's a high level what simulation by security is. And how do, where, what kind of environment, infrastructure do these protocols run on? <clears throat> and this was mentioned, I guess Sarpita was uh, talking about this uh, yesterday. So one is uh, <clears throat> a point-to-point -point model, okay, where there are dedicated uh, pairwise uh, links. Okay, they could be reliable and pr or secure. And we're going to be calling this thing SMT for secure message transmission, which should not be misunderstood by SMT in the information theoretic sense, whether well, that means uh, something else. But here it's just secure, you know, secure communication between two parties. All right, so that's the basic uh, communication infrastructure. And we might also assume something called a broadcast or broadcast channel, okay, where the functionality can be represented like this. There's a party broadcasting things, which is what I'm doing right now, right? I speak and everybody gets the same uh, message, and everybody knows that everybody else got the same message and so forth. Okay, that's a broadcast. So when I say broadcast, I, may, I would be in broadcast channel as opposed to a protocol implementing broadcast on the more basic infrastructure of point-to-point -point channels. All right, so when, when, we, when we are given this as a resource, it's an ideal functionality, a broadcast functionality. Okay, so how is a broadcast channel implemented in the point-to-point -point, uh, network? And there are two flavors. One is uh, the broadcast flavor, which means that just one party is the source. And here's the party, right? So this would be the ideal functionality. You know, it gets a message from the source and then uh, spreads the message around. So everybody will get the same message. And the other flavor is, also mentioned yesterday, Byzantine agreement or consensus, where instead of just one party <clears throat> having input, everybody has an input. Okay, and uh, also they have to satisfy these two properties. So in any case, everybody has to output the same value. Okay, and in the broadcast case, if the sender is honest, then that has to be the output. In the consensus, based on the agreement case, if all the honest parties start with the same value, that has to be the output. So it's a non-triviality condition. Okay, and this is the picture representing the functionality. All right, so this is uh, well known. 
and this would be the real world security definition. And typically, it has, it has, it has been property based, meaning by representing these two, but by posing these two properties conditions that the, any product has to satisfy. And this would be the <coughs> ideal world simulation based definition. Okay? So that's the communication model that was the illustration of broadcast. And we can require further properties of execution of protocols such as synchronous communication. Okay, the protocol proceeds as round, has to, could, it could have a bounded delay, meaning even a round, the message can get the, you know, can arrive a couple of rounds later, but it's bounded. We will still consider it synchronous, would have a global clock, rounds I mentioned, and would have guaranteed termination. Okay, this is the uh, setting in which we're going to be uh, explaining our results. Okay, so it's basic stuff. And I have to admit, Rand does you know, much better slides than, than myself. That's why I'm borrowing them from him. Okay, so it turns out that uh, there's a love-hate relationship between broadcast and MPC. And what's the love story? Okay, so you can think this, bro you know, when you are running a protocol, you have these resources, the parties communicate, so they can use the, you know, dedicated pairwise uh, channels as well as broadcast. Okay, and that counts as uh, one round. I'm using broadcast in this round, so this happens, that's why everything is flat. All right, and therefore, if you have broadcast, so you can get pretty much everything in the sense that you can compute everything. You can get guaranteed output delivery, assuming that it's majority. And depending if you are in the unconditional information theoretic setting or in the computational setting, you are doing pretty good in the sense that information theoretically, you can compute anything in O depth, where depth is the depth of the circuit representing the computation. And uh, or constant rounds, assuming one way function in the computational setting. All right, and more recently, there's been a lot of work you know, on this. In particular, you can do, you know, just, just using two rounds, which should be optimal. And there is a series of works uh, doing this uh, depending on various types of assumption. Okay, so your broadcast, you're in pretty good shape. And further, you can do more in the sense that these protocols can compose. Now you have a bunch of these protocols running in parallel, okay? And assume that the, the protocol that they are, you're running has a, runs in R rounds. Then if you have a bunch of polynomially many uh, instances of this protocol, you know, they would also run in run or uh, R or OR rounds. Okay, so composition is easy in the setting. Okay, so what's the flip side? And that's the case where broadcast doesn't exist. All right, so what happens in protocols that do not have access to this resource, then you're gonna get a situation like this, where you're gonna have to implement broadcast using the resources that you have, and that's uh, secure channels. But that's not going to be one round anymore. That's not going to be some atomic one round operation. You're going to have to run a protocol. Okay, so, and here's where the things might not be very uh, coherent, but um, so let's see what we know. So, for example, in the unconditional setting, okay, you, this is what uh, Lamport et al., that's the reference that uh, Arpita mentioned, established early on that you need, you know, the number of corruptions, which uh, I call T, and then it's total number of parties, has to be less than a third, all right? And now you may ask, uh, well, you can use crypto and you can do better, and we'll see that. But it turns out that if you use crypto, or if you're going to go above one, uh, one third, right, you're going to need, besides crypto, a trusted setup. And this was shown by early also, later, but uh, not well on paper by Borkerding. I think I'm missing a G there. Okay, and Rand now wants us to know that uh, 
some functions cannot be computed without, uh, can function can be computed without setup, right? Okay, so let's uh, look at the, so these are protocols implementing this primitive broadcast. Let's, uh, let's look at what we know about the run complexity of these protocols. So the first lower bound is that uh, deterministic protocols have to run for omega n rounds, specifically t plus one rounds. Okay, so the original protocol, the original algorithm that uh, Lampo et al. Uh, proposed ran for t plus one rounds, but it was shown that this is optimal, deterministically. Okay, so Fisher Lynch, Dolev Strong, and you know early eighties, right? You know pretty much right after this uh, pro the protocol, this uh, problem was formulated. All right, and this protocol, actually the strong protocol, matches that lower bound, okay, and it tolerates a arbitrary number of corruptions. Okay, T less than N also assumes a PKI, which we just thought was uh, necessary. And we're not going to go over the, what the protocol does, but essentially it runs for T plus one rounds, where the sender signs a message that you want to send, that they want to send, the party receives this message, you know, figure out how many signatures it has and keep track of message signature value. And if they get a different message, they put it in that set, right? But they keep doing this for D plus one rounds. And at the end, if they have conflicting, in that set, conflicting messages signatures, say like the sender sign says zero and one, okay, that's, uh, they're going to output like a default value. Okay, if you run D plus one rounds, everybody's going to have, uh, is going to learn this contradiction. Okay, it was a very simple protocol runs for the optimal number of rounds, and it's very easy to explain. Okay, but it runs, but it runs in linear number of rounds. Okay, and it, that was in the cryptographic setting, and in the information theoretic setting, you cannot do uh, arbitrary number of corruptions. <clears throat> you can only tolerate one third, and this is uh, this is the paper that um, Arpita was impressed uh, with. And one thing that we're going to start, terminology we're going to start introducing is that we're going to call these protocols deterministic termination. Okay, fixed number of rounds are going to run, it's going to run for T plus one rounds. DT stands for deterministic termination. And as I mentioned, this composed nicely. All right, we mentioned that these protocols require um, O N rounds. And the thing is, if you had a protocol, MPC protocol using this broadcast resource that you're going to instantiate this by a broadcast protocol, you're going to you get into this situation. Now you're going to blow up, expand the number of rounds. All right. So here's the uh, again. So it turns out that uh, okay, so that's, that's deterministic, and turns out that there are more lower bounds in terms of if you run a protocol by R rounds, and I'll explain what the randomized, the randomized protocol for this problem is. Turns out you run for R rounds, you, you have some probability estimate. And it turns out that since this linear number of rounds will be expensive, also researchers early on started looking at using randomization, especially by Benor in 83 and Revy in 83, and I'll say something uh, more in the next slide. But it's being a bunch of um, you know, uh, uh, follow-ups to these uh, protocols, okay? Except that now, before we call the other protocols the deterministic termination, these protocols have probabilistic termination, right? They're going to be using some sort of coin tossing, okay? There's going to be an expected number of rounds that they have to run for, right? And... So we do not know a priori beforehand what the number, uh, what the termination of round is going to be, and also importantly, it is known that they won't be able to terminate, uh, terminate as the same in the same round. Okay, so you implemented this thing, you're going to get expected constant round for this protocol as opposed to linear, which is pretty good, but they're not going to be on the same page. Okay, one pro one good. Uh, party terminates here, the other might terminate uh, later, like one round or two rounds later. Okay, we call that non-simultaneous termination. But let me expand on this a little bit more. So 
So as I mentioned, Rabin and Benor figured out that this problem, you can use randomization for this. And in fact, that uh, as Rabin uh, noticed, consensus broadcasts can be reduced to the existence of a global coin. Okay, if you, if you have a beacon, you know, in every round, bro, you know, broadcasting to everybody like a random value, okay, you, it's very easy to get consensus of broadcast from that beacon and expect a constant number of rounds. Okay, so this was early on, early 80s, and then there was a lot of work. So this is the beacon thing. Right now what you want to do is you want to implement this beacon amongst the parties uh, running the protocol. So you have this global coin functionality using parties' local randomness, All right? So there's been quite a bit of work in, in this, uh, on this, and until the breakthrough result by Felma Mikali, which you know how to do that, you know, how to build a global coin from scratch. And uh, at the high level, it, proceeds, it works like this, it goes in phases, right? In each uh, phase, each party has an input bit, and the first phase would be the input bit that the parties uh, have as, as, as input to the consensus problem. If every, and here I'm describing the consensus problem, you can get a broadcast protocol from consensus. And if everybody, say, started and had the same bit, that would be the validity condition, then terminates in one at the end of the phase. And otherwise, for ATP, right, all parties agree on the same bit at the end of that phase. And probability one minus p, okay, no agreement at the end of the phase, or the average side makes some one party terminate, and the remaining parties will terminate in the next phase. Now you see the connection between the coin flipping the example that we saw, you know, p one half in that case, right, and this type of uh, protocols. All right. So as I mentioned, these protocols have probability termination, terminates in expected, you know, constant rounds. It turns out there is no guarantee termination because the probability is going to be decreasing, right? But um, uh, but they might not agree. You can get them to agree if you run for polylog polylog number of rounds, right? Then you're going to get uh, agreement with uh, high probability. But okay, this is the no guarantee termination part. And as I mentioned, it is known that you cannot get simultaneous termination in this case. Okay, expect across a number of rounds, but parties might not terminate the same round, and you cannot actually achieve that. They do terminate in a constant window, which for now on we're going to be calling the slag. Okay, we have the protocol running, there's going to be a slag where other parties might terminate, you know, uh, like say C rounds later. Okay, so and I mentioned about bits, it turns out that it's easy to extend this thing to a multi-valued case, as you will be broadcasting not just bits, but uh, arbitrary messages. And you can uh, combine these two, you can combine randomized, and uh, you can get a sort of a best of both worlds, things combined into protocols, one deterministic, one randomized. Okay, and, and there's a variant for parallel broadcast, because what we're looking at here is just one instance where one party is gonna be broadcasting stuff, but in an MPC protocol, you can have multiple parties doing the, you know, broadcasting their values, right? So you need an implementation of parallel broadcast. And Ben Orr and Elian um, did that um, uh, in 03. All right. So that was introduction to broadcast consensus, what probabilistic termination is. Now we're going to, and as I mentioned, this protocol is going to be running concurrently in parallel. So what can we say about the composition of these protocols? So there are two things. We mentioned the non-simultaneous termination. And now think of this case where you're going to be running this sequence, you know, this protocol sequentially. Okay, so you're going to run a protocol and you have to run the next instance, but they're not going to be on the same page, right? So how do you know when to start the second execution? Okay, that's a non-simultaneous start problem. And we also have the parallel composition because everybody's doing, you know, broadcasting in, the, uh, in parallel. 
Okay, and uh, so we have a situation type here, things running in parallel. So what would a naive way to compose be? So we do, as we mentioned in the example, we, if we, you know, we don't care about the expected constant, we could run for, you know, O log n number of rounds. Okay, if you run for poly log number of rounds, you know, everything, everything is going to be terminating with high probability. All right, but now you're not, you know, gaining, you're not in the expected, in the constant number of rounds type uh, situation anymore. So that would be naive, and this is the, bring us back to the motivating example. All right, so what happened in the broadcast composition um, area, and this is a prior work. So it turns out the, that sequential composition was considered first by Linda, Lysianska, and Raving, right? where you would have, where you could compose M instances of the protocol, protocols in expected OM rounds. Right? I mentioned Benor, Eli, and Eve, who came up with this, uh, pointed this situation. They figured how to do it in expected constant rounds the parallel composition. And there is uh, more work in the cryptographic setting by Katz and Cook, right? And all these uh, works uh, use a property-based definition, as I mentioned at the beginning. So you have to specify this property, this property, and so forth. And what we are trying to do is um, simulation-based, because it's nicer for composition, and this is how things work, all right? So what happens when you try to you know, have security-based, uh, simula uh, simulation-based definitions and proofs of this, uh, this type of protocol. And that's the, that's the main problem, is how you're going to simulate probabilistic termination. All right? And looking ahead in simple terms, when you have this deterministic behavior type thing, it's easy to simulate, right? Because remember these two worlds, right? So at some point, the protocol is going to output something, the simulator has to output something, right? But now you can have the real world running one of these protocols, and what the simulation to do? It right? has to have some hint, has to figure out to do something, so they're going to be on the same page with all the extinguishers, and are going to say, well, no, this came from the real world. All right? So this is the crux of what we're trying to do, that to have simulation-based treatment of probabilistic termination protocols. All right, so let me remind you what the setting is. We use secure channels, SMT. We use the synchronous communication version of UC, which was uh, posed by Katz, Maurer, Tuckman, and Zikas. Except that these guys looked at this, you know, they were here, they were, you know, the UC framework is inherently asynchronous, right? So they had like a synchronous fix, so that, you know, synchronous, well, it's much easier to talk about protocols, reasonable things, and so forth. So they had a synchronous fix for the UC framework, so you can uh, have a synchronous uh, uh, version. And essentially, the ideal functionality is parameterized by the number of rounds that this protocol is going to be running for. And the way they handle this is uh, they, they work in, the parties here work in something called a fetch mode in the ideal world where they keep asking the functionality, you know, it's my output value, it's my output value, and so forth. Okay, at some point the simulator, when the, know, the simulator knows that everything, we reach reached around, where output is going to reproduce in the real world, you says, here's your output. Okay, so that's the term, but these protocols are term termination. And it turns out they don't capture, it doesn't capture this uh, issue of probabilistic termination. Okay, and, this is uh, the fermi Michali protocol, as we saw before. We mentioned it works on in phases. In each phase, uh, party has input bit, and it works like this. Same bit, terminate, coin flip, you know, with some probability it terminates with probability 1 minus p. The ball is the adversary's uh, park, and, you know, says uh, maybe some terminate, maybe nobody terminates, and they go back, and uh, so forth. Okay, so we try to model this. Are there questions so far? 
Uh, what time did it start? 20 minutes left. Okay. So let's see how we were able to deal with this issue. And we call that a framework for modern product determination. And here what we came up with is a what we call a canonical synchronous functionality. Okay, for first step, we're in the idea world, so let's just make things simpler and we'll worry about this uh, number of rounds, expected number of rounds later. So we have this canonical functionality that has, so in a sense, we separate the function, we know what the, fu the functionality is going to try to compute, we separate the function from the round structure, and we just have two rounds, okay, input round and output round. Okay, for this functionality. And this is going to be parameterized by the function it tries to compute. A is the input that the adversary might provide. And some leakage function to capture you know, what, what might be leaked from the computation. But it would go like this. Right? This happens, you know, protocol is running. So there is uh, inputs coming in. All right? And there is an input from the adversary that can provide at any time. And then there's going to be the output round. Okay, where party starts asking, well, give me my result, give me my output, so output coming up, coming out, another request, and so forth. Okay, easier version. Okay, two rounds, except that protocols take more rounds. Okay, so we're going to try to figure out how to enhance this functionality to deal with that problem. And before I do that, let me see how I can capture how can express known tasks with um, this functionality. For example, for SFE, secure function evaluation. So if you're trying to compute a function G, it's going to be this function where A is the input provided by the adversary, and the leakage is going to be the you know, size of the inputs. Okay, for broadcast, it's going to be the same type of thing, right? The imp, and then there's going to be a, a agreement value output. And the leakage is going to be the size of the input, and not necessarily there's a definition for where you're dealing with adaptively secure protocol, in which you have sort of have to hide the, the input. But otherwise, if you don't have that, this would be just the, the input values, output values, because in broadcast there's no privacy. Where right? you just broadcast this stuff, there's no privacy requirement. And that's going to come up um, later on where we try to move from broadcast to a general MPC protocol. And finally, another one, Byzantine agreement or consensus, where everybody has an input. Okay, so here we don't have the privacy requirement. And so one possible definition is if there are at least n minus t parties provide the same value, then that will be the output. Otherwise, the other study might force the thing to output something the function to output something. Okay, so that was the canonical functionality definition of for these tasks. And now we're going to make it more complicated. So we're going to have these things. I'm going to have a, something that we call the synchronous normal form, where to simplify things, we're going to have one of these things, you know, um, called a sequentially. Okay, no parallel execution of this thing. So one at a time, it should be easier to analyze. And this is, would be, for example, the case of the Feldman Mikali protocol, where they would communicate, toss a coin, and then do some voting here, send their messages. Okay, so you can represent each of these uh, boxes by this um, canonical functionalities. Okay, so as I mentioned, protocols take more rounds. So what we have is only two rounds. So we're going to see how to extend. So I have to make this ideal object, you know, compatible with the real world protocol. And we call that extending rounds. Okay, and we're going to deal that with, uh, with that with a so-called wrapper. Okay, which is going to, so it's going to work in different ways if it is a deterministic termination or probabilistic termination, but it's going to be parameterized by the round or a distribution okay, where the round, the output round is going to happen. Okay, if it is a deterministic 
protocol, this is going to be parameterized by, say, t plus 1. Okay, so you run for t plus 1 runs, so I run t plus 1, there is an output. Okay, so, and this would be the termination round. And then you would, you know, work like this. This stuff is leaked to the adversary. Parties will provide inputs. And then we start asking for output. But notice that, you know, the wrapper doesn't let, doesn't let things through over here until, you know, the round where it's supposed to, almost supposed to take place, which should be coming up. The adversary can pro provide its input at any time. And at some point, okay, we fix, we have that, uh, we hit that uh, bound. So things get through and the output starts to come up. Okay, so the wrapper provides this um, uh, round extension uh, thing. All right, that's easy to termination, termination. What happens in probabilistic termination case? All right, so we're gonna do sort of similar, but now we're gonna have a distribution. So corresponding to, you know, if we, do, if we were doing this uh, geometric thing, coin tossing, that will be the distribution for, for the output round, okay? And that's what the sampling here uh, means. And here is the termination, so the output is going to be provided by that round. And also the adversary might decide, no, I want this guy to get the output earlier. So we have this uh, freedom and things are going to be working the same way, okay? So here it says, well, I want this guy to, to get his output first, right? And at some point, things get through, and uh, you get the output. So is it clear? So now we have the framework to, uh, to formulate and analyze these protocols. And where do we stand? So for example, now we can show, we can provide a simulation-based proof of fellow mechanics protocol. Okay, before it was... Um, property based. Now we can provide this and by you know doing the this uh, wrapping with the wrapper. Okay and this is the geometric distribution as I mentioned corresponding to the coin tossing. Now this assumes that all parties start in the same round. Okay what's going to happen if this thing has to be used twice? In the second time, these guys are not on the same page. Okay, you have to you know resynchronize. And this is what we do next: deal with the case of non-simultaneous start. And we're gonna we're gonna call that the slag. And that's protocol specific. You have this protocol. You know, it might be that if one protocol gets the output, the other guy gets in the next round or two more rounds and so forth. So we're gonna use C to denote this uh, slag. Okay. And uh, what we're trying to achieve is that the new execution of this protocol would happen after all parties finish the previous one. And as we saw, some of the guys might uh, finish earlier. Okay, so which would not be a problem if you assume broadcast as a resource, but if you're implementing it, you might have a situation like this, and this means that these guys finish early, these guys are still going. So it could be they need some additional phase, but it could be that these guys could, you know, get started with the same, uh, with the protocol, the, the next execution right away, and that would not be secure. Okay, some of the guys are getting maybe potentially the output of the previous thing with, earlier, which they were not supposed to. Right, so there's an overlap would be an overlap between the previous and the next uh, instance of the protocol. All right, so this was uh, looked at in the past. And the goal would be, now if you have L of these uh, protocols, sequence of L of these protocols, each taking O1 rounds, what you would like is that the sequential composition takes all L rounds. Right? Okay, so one potential naive solution is, okay, I know that if I do this uh, coin toss in business, and as I say, I run the protocol for polylog rounds, okay, everybody's gonna be terminating this by that round, and I can you know, continue 
then, but then I'm going to be wasting potentially a lot of rounds. Okay, I will not be satisfying this goal. All right, and this is a big simplified here. So these guys uh, were running x times one, but this guy is, uh, you know, there's a slack here, and they're going to wait for a long time until they start the next uh, instance. Second solution is, well, I know that the slag is, uh, you know, say C, and I expand each round by, say, 2C plus 1, which might or might not become clear later. All right, and that works for the first execution. So you're going to have a slag of 2C plus 1. You're just blowed up by this. So what's going to happen in the next execution? So the slag is going to be this much times the slag, Right? And if you keep going with the sequence, you're going to get some sort of exponential blow up in the number of rounds. All right? So that, that is solution number two. And so this is uh, uh, what these guys uh, did. So LLR had this resynchronization points. And we had simpler solutions in uh, Benor Elianif and Katz group, but they were simpler and partial proofs. What we're going to do is we're going to introduce a generic compiler to deal, to deal with this uh, issue and reduce the slackness to one. All right, it's going to be simulation based. I'm going to have a composition theorem. And the main idea is that we're going to be adding, same as before, this 2C plus 1 business, we're going to be adding dummy rounds, but in a tweaked way. And what we do is extend each round to 3C plus 1 where C is the slack, right? So C would be one, so if they're off by one round. Where the first two C plus one rounds work like this, the party, you know, for the uh, listen for two C plus one rounds, and in round C plus, C plus one, listen and send. And the last C rounds, if you think of C one round, we have like one additional buffer round where, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm going like this. I'm just, you know, killing time here until the next uh, uh, instance starts, right? And you can think of um, this. You, are they getting slides for this? Are the slides delivered or just the video? All right, so I'll go faster. So here, see, you're trying to implement this uh, PSMT, parallel secure message transmission, with slack is one, meaning you send that you might receive in the parallel one round later. So you have a situation like this, right? Where C is one. Okay, so the first guy, the fast guy should be able to send here. The slow guy sends here, and then this guy is killing time. Okay, and uh, here I think the output is supposed to say that you can output already in uh, round one. No, I don't know what that means. So here, the, the party would be able to output, okay, and the, the guest guy would output here. There's something like one off, but the, what secures the situation is that this, uh, there's this buffer, this frontier here, where both execution will be isolated. All right, and then you keep uh, going, and you can look at the details, details in the paper, but this trick allows, you, allows us to do this uh, synchronization, assuming 3C plus 1. Right, and we also have some stuff for concurrent composition that is coming up later. And it turns out that uh, we can reduce this blow up to one using techniques by Bracha, which is works as follows: when in some protocol you receive an, receive an output, you send OK to all parties. When you receive enough messages, OK messages, you accept, and then when you receive a minus t you know, you terminate, all right? So you can do this, except that this requires actually a majority of honest parties. But the point is that you can, using this trick, you can reduce this asynchrony to one round, all right? So this is how we are dealing with uh, sequential composition, all right? And so now remember, we had this termination business, this wrapper, now we just add another wrapper to deal with this non-simultaneous start to handle this issue. All right, so then we get a composition theorem that we say 
we have this using simultaneous start, we can compile it to you know, this situation where um, you know, we have non-simultaneous termination using this additional wrapper. Okay, so what do we get from this? We have parallel broadcast, implementation of parallel broadcast in the point-to-point -point channel model assuming, you know, in expected constant rounds. And this gives us a recipe for MPC where you would first assume, you know, broadcast channel and then replace the broadcast channel using this uh, fluorescent determination parallel broadcast protocol. Okay, and as a result, what we get is on the P2P model, we can have information theoretic MPC in expected O depth rounds, and assuming one in the cryptographic setting, expected constant rounds. Okay, so we got MPC and expected constant rounds from, P, uh, from point to point channels. We got one MPC, right? Now, you have a bunch of MPCs, you have a bunch of arbitrary protocols. Okay, so how do we deal with that? So the MPC protocols themselves now have probabilistic termination. All right, and we saw that we do this in a naive uh, parallel composition, it's not round preserving. And that's the observation that in, in more detail, the solutions for broadcast that we saw work because this primitive is uh, privacy free. Okay, so in a nutshell, what is going to happen is how do you get these things to terminate? So if you have to run one instance, you run, say, m instances in parallel. Okay, and with high probability, one of them is going to terminate, and you have to figure out which one terminated and so forth. Right, but these things are going to be out of sync, and might be out of sync, and also an adversary might be. If you run the same instance in parallel, you might the adversary might be providing different inputs to the different instances. So privacy, security might be violated because the adversary might now learn something, you know, from one of these. So the, each instance is going to give you a different value, at a different output potentially. Right, so security would be violated. All right. You don't have that problem in broadcast because uh, you know you don't care about the privacy of the input. All right, so can we get this for the arbitrary protocols? And now what we're trying to do in general terms is now we are computing. We have say we have a bunch of SFEs and PCs right in parallel. We want to compute this stuff. Okay, this is parallel where you know each party has an input for each of the functions and the output is this corresponding to each function okay these arbitrary computations and in fact the you know running time of these functions might be you know different okay so can we do this and here we we say yes and no if we, we're talking about doing this in black box way, one uh, option is to do it black box with, you would have some sort of compiler that combines all these uh, things, right? And you want to do that black box with respect to the function itself, all right? And black box with respect to the protocol itself. And can you guess who the I in these references is? Take a quick guess. You well? Okay, so it's some sort of like a weaker notion where you get, you're given a protocol, okay, you, but you don't know what the code works. You have all access to the say next message function because you're going to, you know, and this gives us more power because we're going to be doing more things into the protocol than in the function black box, right? And I'm sort of running out of time, so I'm going to just catch what's happening okay so we know this the only thing is that now the we, we're also doing it for synchronous mpc with the enhancement that we just saw for policy termination 
And let me look at the, let's look at the protocol black box parallel composition first, where we have positive problems, a positive uh, answer, where we can show that if we got these protocols realizing these functions, we have a compiler, right, that takes these protocols realizing the parallel composition of this function in such a way that the expected uh, uh, termination time is the max of the expected of uh, pi i, right? And this black box with respect to the protocols, right? And again, the, the compiler doesn't know the code of the protocol. Okay, so and the technique, the is, uh, the the approach that we have is similar in the sense that. So we're going to be running a bunch of instances in parallel of each protocol, and then you know uh, make conclusions out of that execution, because it's going to be running much of times. Also know that this is the same length here, but it might not be. And as a result, oh, and the technique, one technique that we use is, um, you know, we have something to commit and prove their input so that we don't have this problem of the adversary abusing the parallel executions and trying to provide different inputs to different um, instances. Okay. So we will have a situation like this, and you know, would, you would have to do the same GMW type approach where you would you prove consistency in your knowledge, right? And there are a bunch of uh, issues with this, so you have to come up with this uh, tweak of the commit approve functionality. Now we have an uh, issue of reactive functionalities with Paris termination, or you, you might have mentioned what a reactive functionality is. Like a bunch of uh, functionalities, they, each of them itself might have priority termination. You have to deal with that. We have to extend sequential composition. We need some other stuff. And we have to be able to recover from invalid zero knowledge proofs. Okay, so there are a bunch of challenges to get this, but we get it. Okay, so to summarize, we have these protocols to provide these functions. We have the compiler. And what we get is you know, the parallel composition of that. This fun each protocol has all the expected constant round. The, com the compiled version has uh, parallel version has expected constant round. Right? And it's black box with respect to the protocol. Two more minutes. Okay, so what's the situation in the functionally, the black box with respect to the functionality, which is called that functionally black box protocols. So, right, so the parties here have oracle access to, to the functionality or the functions in this functionality class. The parties themselves don't know the code, the functionality is black box. All right, and it turns out that you have a positive, we have a positive answer if the protocol is semi honest. And essentially, we are using the same. Um, approach as before, doing these parallel versions, but the thing is semi-honest, so it's okay. See the, mul the multiple instances for each uh, function. All right, and so this works out. And we get, you know, correctness, privacy, and run complexity. Okay, so we'll do the analysis. What happens in the malicious case of Fun, you know, black box with respect to functionalities. It turns out that the previous protocol is not maliciously secure, and the issue, the problem is what we I mentioned before: if a party, an adversary, inputting different inputs to them to the various instances. Okay, and this, if you use this batch parallel composition technique, this is inherent. Okay, so there's a negative result using known techniques and it's open whether you can achieve this using different techniques. All right, so we, in fact, we show that um, if you use this approach, either your correctness loss, privacy is broken or the run complexity blows up and using this batching technique. All right, to wrap up, what have we done? So we looked at composability of these type of protocols that have probabilistic termination. We presented a framework for the cryptographic protocols in such a way, you know, it's a composable way in such a way that, you know, you can do your standalone design and then compose it. 
we saw broadcast in uh, one rounds. We from that we we figure how to do uh, an MPC without losing rounds. So we get O depth for the information theoretic case, O one for the in the cryptographic setting, and just now we just flash some notion about how to extend this to arbitrary protocols, right? To black box with uh, black box with respect to protocols or with respect to the functionality. Right, and so what are the challenges that we face? All right, so can we do can we do this RAM preserving black box with respect to functionality using different techniques? This assumes the synchronous uh, network model. You could extend this to you know something called par partially synchronous or asynchronous. And finally, this assumes. Uh, uh, honest majority situation. Okay, for example, remember to this to, to apply this Braca trick, you need an honest majority. But we know, and uh, this is one of my papers, that you can do still expected constant rounds in the dishonest majority case, assuming that the number of dishonest parties is not too big. Right? If the surplus is a k, right, so you can get an ok, uh, <laughs> ok, uh, expected number of rounds. All right. So can can you go above the you know dishonest honest majority? Uh, can you be the dishonest majority case and still assume uh, achieve this um, uh, round preservation uh, property? All right. So the main references for this is uh, the first part that I talk about is in the, was in Crypto sixteen general crypto and the second part looking at arbitrary protocols was in ICAL 17, and they are both in the ePrint. Thanks. Questions? So what will be the main challenges to extend these things to asynchronous protocol, completely asynchronous protocols? I guess you would like to uh, extend it to this, uh, um, the eventual delivery business. Yeah, yeah. That's under yeah, the yeah. computing. Yeah. Um, it shouldn't be a big uh, deal. But you have to deal with this uh, situation now that you know the parties are part of a core set. Right in this instance, so what happens in the next instance, and so forth, and so that require uh, you know a bit of care. But otherwise, you can use most of this uh, you know uh, formalism, I think. Yeah. Anything else? No. It's okay. Okay. Thank. Thanks. Where's Where's my present? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Did you like your t-shirt? Oh yeah. <laughs> yes. Nice. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks. So yesterday when you were not here in the morning, I exposed one of your secret admirers. He's still there in the, uh, the audience. So you have got a task to find him during the coffee break. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs>